Welcome back to America's Commercial Real Estate Show. I'm Michael Bull. This segment is brought to you by my company, Bull Realty. For customized asset and occupancy solutions, visit bullrealty.com or contact me directly. Well, today we're talking about mixed use. Mixed use might be right for you, for your company, for you as a tenant, for you as an investor. And uh, please welcome my next guest. It's Jeff Garrison, and he's a partner with S.J. Collins Enterprises, and he's here in Studio One. Jeff, thanks for joining us, sir. Good morning. Well, you guys are doing some great developments all around the eastern seaboard and around the around the southeast, and I guess you've done some in the northeast. So, um, the first thing I'd like to ask you is loca about location. You know, what makes a, a good property? Because some of these mixed use are kind of their own world, right? What makes a good property a good location? How do you pick it? So the location, we, we will say that we only focus on A-plus locations. And the reason is, is because in order to have the right mix of uses, in order to have the energy that you're trying to create, you really need accessibility, you need mm -hmm. visibility, you need all the things that are primarily focused on retail, but you mm -hmm. also need a great property that, that will fit the, the needs of an office tenant, mm -hmm. uh, that will fit the needs of multi-use and, and hotel. So here in Atlanta, uh, we're working on a project just on the west side of Midtown. Uh, it's a great project because it allows us to bring in this entertainment venue uh, retail. Uh, we have a hotel that's an unbranded Marriott back of house. Uh, we're able to bring in WeWork and Georgia Tech. Uh, and that really is driven by this location, which is marquee and in the center of what is the urban fabric. Yeah. And some of these projects you've done have been in these smaller suburban cities around these city centers, right? Uh, and, and that's something that happens around, you know, all around the country. What's different about those projects? Well, you really have to think about the curated mix. What is the right mix? And oftentimes we as developers think that we know what the right mix is. But oftentimes what we need to do is really spend time in the community because at the end of the day, when we leave and I come back to my home here in Atlanta, uh, when I leave the Northeast, when I leave uh, you know, Virginia or Southern Florida, I'm coming back to my home. This, this is a property that's going to thrive or fail because the community buys in or doesn't. So what we do is we spend a lot of time making sure that the community is invested. What do you want to see? What is the right tenant mix for you? Do you want more restaurants? Do you want more uh, fitness, boutique fitness? Do you want large scale fitness? How do you want that to connect? And so I think oftentimes we really need to get into that community to understand what they're going to buy into and invest in. And how are you finding municipalities related to getting the zoning and the density you need these days? Well, uh, <laughs> you know that you're at the, uh, the, the sort of top end of a cycle when the communities really are pushing back. I mean, everything from... Uh, you know, architectural review committees to new boards and local um, community activist groups that we have to meet with. Uh, in Decatur, which is here in Georgia, we met with 50 different uh, groups. And those were neighborhood groups. Those were commissioners. Those were, um, you know, different neighborhood commutes had, had started their own, um, you know, community activist network. And they email. And in order to get them to invest in the property to, to really support you at zoning, uh, you've got to spend time and understand what's important to them. Yeah. So how long did that process take from start to, 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 to putting the first shovel in the ground? Well, typically for us on a project like that, which is a mixed use project with, mm -hmm. with a little bit of office, a little, you know, a lot of apartments and, and a grocery anchored uh, Whole Foods is the anchor there, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of restaurants. Uh, what was important to that community was that we have a lot of park space. Typically, okay. it takes us about 15 months to bring that uh, all to bear. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, it's actually quicker to go through the process early on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, maybe I can do without going to talk to them. Maybe an attorney can walk me through the process. The mm -hmm. fact is, you've got to embed yourself in the community. Yeah. <clears throat> you have to understand what they want. And because we spent so much time in the community, when we actually went in front of the board, uh, to get our final vote, we actually had five people stand up from neighborhood groups, and that nothing's going to nothing's going to get you a unanimous vote. And they 
supported you. They supported me. <laughs> That's good. And, and so that is that is atypical, but it's mm. worth putting the time in up front. Not only are yeah. you going to get it right, uh, but they're going to they're going to support you. And you mentioned getting some uh, pushback, uh, maybe um, from the municipalities and the and the local people in the community who think that hey maybe there's enough apartments already and and maybe even uh, lenders and people in the project look at uh, existing rents and occupancy in a market but when you're building uh, multifamily in a mixed use development uh, what do you say to them what's different well it really is interesting mm -hmm. because a lot of people are reluctant to enter into mixed use it's complicated it, it, it makes the project a lot longer to, to construct and to build mm -hmm. and get out of the ground mm -hmm. but the fact is is that what we're seeing is in Newport News, Virginia, we have a uh, apartment complex that's adjacent to Whole Foods and P.F. Chang's, a number of local restaurants and a fitness, 40,000 square foot, One Life Fitness there. Our rents are 20% higher than the prevailing market. And when we went to our latest project, we said, we're gonna do it again. We're gonna create 20% higher rents and we're gonna do it because the energy of that development is there, right? People yeah. wanna be there. People would rather be there than they would be a mile down the street, but every time they want a good or service or go to a restaurant, they got to jump in a car. Now, did the lender look at you and go, oh, really? <laughs> they, they, they do. And, and I think yeah. one of the great things uh, about S.J. Collins yeah. is that we're able to say, well, you're right. It's, it's hard to say that the prevailing market is 25 bucks a square foot and we're going to get 32. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is that we can go back to our last project and say, we did it here. Yeah. We, we will do it again. And we can point to that over and over and over again. Uh, and so mixed use projects are the same. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Well, um, I, I with you there. I mean, I have a, a, a little second home at uh, Lake Lanier, which is north of Atlanta. And I like to go there on the weekends and I have a little place in town, Atlanta. And now we're empty nesters, my wife and I. And I'd love to live in a nice apartment in a mixed use development in the perimeter area where I can walk out and go to a restaurant. And I think I would pay more rent when I know I could just walk out and maybe go to my office or walk out and go to a restaurant, maybe not get it in a car. Right. I could see why people would pay more. It makes sense. Let me ask you about the office part of these mixed use developments, Jeff, being, because, you know, it's uh, interesting. You've got some pretty large co-working tenants like we work in these projects, right? That's correct. Uh, when you have that large of a component, and talk to us about an example of how large some of these uh, uh, co-working tenants are in these mixed use, how does that impact the overall development? It's, it's a great question, mm -hmm. and co-working, in our opinion, is here to stay. I mean, the energy, the excitement, the way that people want to work, it captures it all. Mm -hmm. I think we, we work is a perfect example. Uh, our project here, the Interlock, which is in West Midtown of Atlanta, uh, we've got 120,000 square feet with WeWork. Uh, some of the challenges is a lot of the bankers that we go and talk to, they say, well, hey, what happens during a recession? We think that the occupancy uh, will go from 92 percent, which is their average, down to the low 80s. And, and really, that's that's based off nothing but their supposition. Right. When we look to Europe, when we see what's happening in Germany and uh, in Europe, where they have decreasing GDP, the occupancy of WeWork and other co-working space is actually going up. People don't want to commit to a five-year lease when they mm -hmm. can go into this great space with mm -hmm. this high energy uh, where they can capture all these new young workers. Uh, they can mm -hmm. keep them happy. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of excitement there. Most of our projects either include a co-working space when we have office because we think that mm -hmm. energy is great. Um, you know, so uh, we're, we're, we spend a lot of time thinking about it. But it is something that's new to the market that the, the bankers uh, you have to spend a little bit more time with. Yeah, I bet. Now, when you're doing a new co-working mixed use project and you have co-working in a large component of it like that, a large space, uh, and you're building it new, uh, what's it look like? Because I think of them going in some of the older buildings I've been in and in Chicago, New York, Atlanta, that they, they, they kind of make a cool interior in an older building. Uh, but when I think of mixed use, my first thought is retail. Uh, so what, what, what's the new WeWork look like in a mixed-use development? Well, I think thinking about it from a retail perspective is very important because mm -hmm. as retail-minded folks, and mm -hmm. I come from a retail background, we really are always thinking about the space, right, mm -hmm. about the access, about the visibility, about mm -hmm. the branding, mm -hmm. uh, about the signage, about the parking, how far is the parking. All those things are also important to uh, co-working space. Mm -hmm. The other things that are important is the ceiling height, right? Mm -hmm. People want this loft ceiling space. They don't want the nine foot restrictive, you know, low energy setting. They also mm -hmm. want a lot of glass. 
Uh, so at, uh, at the Interlock, we actually brought in a View Glass, which is a new product. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually have money from SoftBank, the same uh, investor in WeWork. Mm -hmm. uh, they're able to put in this glass where we don't have to have any mecha shades or any shading system at all. It will actually reflect whatever the light environment is outside. It will create, uh, it, will, it will shade the, the glass so that you never have to put shades on it, nice. uh, which is a really exciting thing. And that's what people want. Yeah. In the new construction, we're still, you know, in old older buildings, they typically come in with the laminate sort of floor because the patterns in the, in the floors are not mm -hmm. consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, with here, it's a consistent pour that we're doing uh, for WeWork. So they'll be able to use the existing and probably polish the existing concrete instead of trying to bring in some sort of laminate flooring, which I think is a, is a great touch as well. Yeah. So, and if you're watching our video, maybe you're seeing it. If you're listening to the podcast, go to CREshow.com and, and look for the show on uh, mixed use developments. And uh, uh, we'll have uh, a link to the video. Uh, so, so Jeff, that building that you build new for WeWork in a mixed use development, it look, you look at it and go, oh, it's an office building. You don't look at it and go, what is it? <laughs> well, you do. It's different, right? Yeah. The, the office buildings that we've grown up knowing are these shiny towers that are, you know, 10, 12, 15 stories mm -hmm. high. And really, that, that energy type is, is really hard to be on the 40th floor and come down to the bottom and feel like you're engaged with whatever that entertainment venue is or restaurant or uh, any of the retail uses. So we like to build a, a smaller building. I think 200,000 square feet is our perfect size. It's mm -hmm. a boutique size. Uh, and we also like the, the building to be reflective of the surrounding community. So uh, if we're in a community that's more industrial feel, which is a lot of what's happening in these uh, urban locations, right, mm -hmm. as the industrial core is converting back to uh, you know, a livable, workable, playable environment. So we're trying to be more reflective. So a lot of brick, a lot of concrete, a lot of glass, a lot of lead pane windows, mm -hmm. all those things reflect the community. You don't want to be an eyesore. You want to fit in, even though that you're this new uh, product. And when you're doing these mixed use developments, Jeff, brand new from, from the ground up, uh, do you have different ownership components? Uh, they're different uh, uh, investors and companies involved in the different parcels. Or are you guys all in on everything? Well, it really depends on the location. So we're working in uh, just outside of Metro Atlanta in Roswell, Georgia. We've got a project called the Southern Post, uh, which is apartments and office and retail. We will be the owner of all those. And it is a cleaner. We actually have townhomes as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be cleaner for us to own the entire project. It also helps us to create some value on the management. Mm -hmm. uh, so typically, if you're managing office is one component, the retail is one component, the parking deck is one component, uh, the apartments is another, uh, you're going to lose some value. So there is economies of scale that we're going to be able to take advantage of, which will make this project uh, really sing. In Atlanta at the Interlock, that project is uh, a large number of condos with a master condo association. I mean, our uh, closing documents are this big. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you really sometimes that's the right mix. We wanted to get in the right hotel uh, provider, the right apartment provider, because it's more luxury. Uh, you know, we're trying to find a very select developer who can hit that mark. And that was important there to have different ownerships. Jeff, we have uh, a tenant we represent who is a little apprehensive about mixed use because um, they really like the ability for their customers to kind of park right at the front door and, and, and come in real quick and then go out. They have a lot of customers that are in and out very quickly. And, and I guess there's some other tenants that you would you have to work with that are used to the traditional mall or traditional shopping center with a lot of open parking. Uh, what do you say to tenants to think about adjusting their, their way of thinking uh, to move forward to get into the energy of some of these mixed use developments. Yeah, I, and I would tell them not to mm -hmm. uh, lower their standard. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it, it is true that having a Starbucks drive-through is mm -hmm. a much more complex in a mixed use center. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think people have pulled it off, but that's very complex. But for a bank, mm -hmm. they should demand from mixed use development that it provide easy access mm -hmm. to their customer base, mm -hmm. and you can still do that. You just have to be thoughtful, and you yeah. can't come into a market and say, "This is what I'm building." Uh, and expect the community to buy in. What you really need to do is spend time in the community, understand what is the need. Yeah. So, for instance, we have a bank at the Interlock, mm -hmm. uh, and that was exactly what their concern was. So we had to make sure that they saw that we were able to create 30-minute spaces that were adjacent to the property. The access was easy. Mm -hmm. They could walk down a corridor to their 
uh, space. They had advertising and engagement from the parking deck. So it wasn't like the back of a building where you have grease traps and mm -hmm. people smoking cigarettes. It is really a nice environment, right? right. Uh, so you really have to focus on those things. And I think so much of what mixed use is nowadays is that people think it's an afterthought for apartments. And that's what uh, that's the mindset that's coming is that, oh, there's apartments, I'm mixed use because I threw some retail at the bottom. That's not thoughtful mixed use. We're talking about a different product type. What do you say, Jeff, to someone who maybe hasn't lived into, in a mixed use and they're considering uh, renting or buying a residential in a mixed use and maybe they're concerned with all this going on around them and the smells from the restaurants and the parking lots and the cars and all of that. Uh, what, what's, what should they know about the experience? What maybe was the positives and negatives? Yeah, I mean, it, it is a great environment. Mm -hmm. And so many people, you and, and I both mm -hmm. want to move into the urban core and leave mm -hmm. our car parked in the garage and, and, and be able to go to work and go to restaurants and enjoy ourselves with never getting back in the car. Yeah. So that, that is the lifestyle that we're trying to provide. Mm -hmm. In order to develop that lifestyle, everything has to be thought out and yeah. mixed use has to be done right, right? So you have to think about what's gonna happen, what's the energy of this mixed use project at 9 a.m.? What's the energy of it at noon? What's the energy of it at midnight? And if you have residents, uh, you know, how was the, uh, so we have a rooftop restaurant. A rooftop restaurant that's really loud until 11 may not be conducive to somebody living. So how do you create the right mix and make sure that you've curated it correctly so that they, they ebb and flow and that, that, that it's a good feel throughout? Yeah. Uh, I don't know that there's any one answer. I think it really does depend on the uh, engagement of the development group. Uh, and so we would like to think that uh, we've been able to, to handle all those concerns well. But I do think it's something that, that people need to think about. And these developments you've done, Jeff, when people lease office space, whether right, it's a traditional office space or a uh, WeWork or something, they're working there. What do they tell you that's different or surprise them about working in an environment like that? Well, certainly it is all about the energy. Mm -hmm. and, and people talk about placemaking and curating mm -hmm. and experience and all that really is mm -hmm. related to the energy. So, mm -hmm. you know, so much of the, you know, the, the, the towers in downtown urban settings are, it's just, there's no energy to your space. It's low ceilings, you're in a, you know, locked box with no windows. So mm -hmm. how do you engage that person? People mm -hmm. wanna work outside. So do yeah. you have patios? Do you have a rooftop? Do you have mm -hmm. comfortable seating? Do you mm -hmm. have a restaurant that serves coffee and baguettes when they get there in the morning? Do you have a restaurant that serves a quick, fast, casual? Do you have restaurants that serve a business dinner? All those things make it to where people work longer and they work better. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I'm a commercial real estate broker and I like to maybe grab a quick dinner and then do some great work after dinner because I'm not I'm not interrupted. Right. I can get a lot done. And, and and I would assume there's a lot of people like that. So if you could go downstairs, have a nice meal, uh, have a great cup of coffee and then go back up and do some work, that would be convenient. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I do think one of the things that is I think about the late 90s and the developments mm -hmm. that were done for retail, because people talk about the retail apocalypse. Mm -hmm. It really is a retail revolution. Yeah. If you look at and you think about your trip uh, to go get a bath mat and, and a plunger. Right. And you park way in the distance. You have to walk through a parking lot that's hot, that, that is, you know, extremely un customer friendly. Yeah. That that experience drain just talking about it drains me, right? Yeah. So how do we change that, right? Otherwise yeah. people are just going to do it online. Yeah. They're just going to shop online. So we have to create the right environment with the right mix, create energy, be thoughtful about every aspect from parking to walkability to what you're sensing to the smell. Everything has to be considered, and that's how you're going to bring people out from behind the computer yeah. and into your center. Yeah, good point. Well, Jeff, what do you say to lenders or investors who say to you, what do you mean you're, going to, you're planning a new mixed-use development? Look where we are in the cycle. <laughs> and this, these good times can't last forever. Well, you, you do have to be uh, you know, cognizant of the fact mm -hmm. that you are subjecting yourself to mm -hmm. all commercial real estate types. Mm -hmm. uh, and it could be that you know, there's times when apartments are hot and mm -hmm. commercials 
you know, not hot. Retail and others are not hot. So you have to be thoughtful because at the end of the day, a year and a half of putting the deal together and then having one of these components, whether it be hotel, apartments, townhomes, you're, you're subjecting yourself to a lot. So yeah. there is real uh, exposure there. But in yeah. order to do it right, uh, you, you do have to invest in, in the right mix of those and make sure that it's a good fit for those property types. Uh, you know, certainly the environment's different now. I mean, yeah. but interest rates as we sit here today are at 2.17 in the 10 mm -hmm. year. Uh, it's great lender environment. There's a lot of investment capital out there seeking good deals. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, is that when you do these projects right, we're seeing record low cap rates. I mean, yeah. you look at uh, Chelsea Market uh, mm -hmm. in, in New York in, the, in a cap rate that's almost incalculable. Mm -hmm. Or you look here in downtown Atlanta, mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple projects that have gone for well below a five cap, mm -hmm. right? And that reflects that this is where investors want to place their money and they yeah. see the long-term value. Yeah. And to that end, they're, they're projects that are different. Uh, and I think that's what a lot of developers are doing today in, in your projects and other projects that, you know what, you can look at the current stock, but if you're creating a little bit of a different product, uh, then it kind of sits in its own and doesn't have as much competition, right? That's, that's amazing. Well, uh, Jeff, that's great information. Thank you for joining us, sir. We appreciate you being on the show. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. And thank you for joining us there around the country. We hope you enjoyed the show. Until next week, be sure that you always lead, learn, and laugh, and join us for America's Commercial Real Estate Show. America's Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Bull Realty. For customized asset and occupancy solutions, visit bullrealty.com. Commercial Agent Success Strategies, incredible training for commercial agents. Visit commercialagentsuccess.com. Red IQ, turning multifamily data into actionable intelligence. Visit rediq.com.